We're going to talk about inflammatory bowel disease. An inflammatory bowel disease is an immunological disorder, which includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. When we compare the two, when we're talking about Crohn's disease, this can happen anywhere in the GI tract. It's most commonly gonna occur in the terminal ileum and the colon. <clears throat> the inflammation does involve all layers of the intestine, and there can be um, areas where there's normal bowel, move, normal bowel between the diseased portions. So you can see these are the diseased areas there. Signs and symptoms for Crohn's disease will include diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, frequent bowel movements, and depending on where in the intestinal tract it occurs, so if it occurs higher in the intestinal tract and it does include or um, involve some of the small intestine, you can have more nutritional problems. For ulcerative colitis, this is going to affect the mucosal layers of the rectum and the colon. So you can see um, much lower in the GI system. Because it is um, affecting the mucosal layers, these patients will develop ulcers in this area. And because they have those ulcers, they're gonna end up having bloody diarrhea. They'll often re also report abdominal pain, and patients with ulcerative colitis can have up to 20 stools per day. Here's just another image kind of showing you um, the different parts that can be affected um, between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. When we think about treatment, in general, treatment for both is to kind of control inflammation, infection. We wanna make sure we're looking at the nutritional status of the patient, decreasing stress, decreasing their symptoms, and improving their quality of life. For patients um, with ulcerative colitis, surgery is going to be more common. So because we have more of a localized area, um, you know, with ulcers more just in the rectum or the colon, you might see part of that removed. Um, and sometimes it might be that part is removed and they just have a hemicolectomy or it's removed and it results in an ostomy. Those patients with Crohn's disease, um, surgery really is a last resort because we have to remember that Crohn's disease can affect any part of the intestinal tract. So if we remove this portion here, um, it's, there's nothing to prevent it from occurring later here. And then you'd be talking about continuously moving parts of the colon. So they really try to avoid uh, surgery for Crohn's disease, if at all possible. When we think about um, some complications, nutritional complications, like I said before, can be um, a major complication for these patients. And again, it's going to be for those patients, it's gonna be worse for those patients when it's impacting the small intestine. So we have to remember, um, you know, the small intestine is gonna be where we're beginning to um, absorb nutrients from our food. And if we're having problems in the small intestine, we're gonna have problems with um, absorption and then we, which will result in uh, malnourishment, malnutrition. Other um, more major complications that we can find would be toxic megacolon. And this is gonna be more common in ulcerative colitis. And so what's happening is the colon is becoming paralyzed. And because the colon is unable to move gas and feces through the GI system, um, you're going to have this major um, distension in the colon. And so what happens is it's gonna become severely distended and then the patient is at risk for perforation. And if the uh, colon would perforate, we're then putting the patient at risk for peritonitis. And remember, peritonitis is the one that really makes this more of a lethal condition. So someone who is suspected of having toxic megacolon, you would anticipate them going to emergent surgery um, to relieve the pressure and remove part of that paralyzed colon so we can resume normal activity within the bowel. 
uh, Crohn's disease, you're going to have more risk of fistulas developing. And um, Crohn's disease can cause sores or ulcers that kind of tunnel through the intestine. So you can see it's, it's tunneling through here and then you can have stool moving to wherever it's tunneling to. So if it tunnels into the vagina, into the bladder, um, it can also tunnel right out of the intestine and into the peritoneal cavity, which again puts you at risk for peritonitis. So obviously if you would um, have the signs and symptoms of peritonitis, this could be one of the causes. Or if you're finding that a patient is having stool um, in their urine or um, in their um, vaginal cavity, this would be a sign and symptom to you that the person could have developed a fistula and you would need to inform the provider uh, right away. So, um, you know, inflammatory bowel disease can be a reason p patients end up with needing to have ostomy surgery, uh, but it can also happen for a lot of other reasons. So perforated bowel, um, when you're thinking about patients with peptic ulcer disease, uh, patients with cancerous tumors. So there's lots of other reasons other than inflammatory bowel disease, but this image here does show you some different types of locations for ostomy placements. So when we're thinking about, uh, you know, ileostomy, again, it's going to be developed in the small intestine, so your stool is only going to make it that far. It's never going to travel through the colon. So you have to remember that the stool coming out of your ileostomy is really going to be um, more liquid, actually all liquid, foul smelling, very caustic to the skin. And again, because it's higher in the GI system, the patient has less opportunity for their intake to absorb the nutrients that they've ingested. Um, colostomies can happen in you know different parts of the, the colon, so the ascending, ascending colon, transverse colon, um, more at the uh, distal colon. And again, depending on where they occur will depend on how normal your bowel movements are and how much nutrients you're getting from the food that you're eating. So wherever that ostomy is developed, the rest of the colon would be removed. Um, those who have a double barrel ostomy, which is in the last image here, oftentimes this is going to be happening for someone who's had just part of the colon removed and they plan to reattach that. So that might be for someone who's had um, a cancerous tumor um, and they're you know letting that area heal because maybe they're having radiation to that area. This might be for someone um, who they're removing. Um, so for example, for Crohn's disease, we talked about surgery being a last resort, but maybe they're gonna remove part and reattach later to try to save the rest of the colon. So um, as this is healing, your your stool and your nutrients would be going through the intestine this way, stool would be coming out of here. This part would be resting um, until they um, decide to reattach. Anyone who has um, any type of ostomy surgery would have the usual post-op assessments. You'd be looking for your usual post-op complications. Now that we have an ostomy, we'd also be worried about um, any obstructions that things are moving through um, appropriately, but then we also have to assess our ostomy site. So the ostomy should be pink, should be a dematis. It might even be more of a beefy red that's all normal. Um, what shouldn't be occurring is any dusky blue coloring. So if you notice that, that means there's some ischemia, so we'd want to alert the provider right away. If there's any black areas, brown, that could indicate necrosis, so absolute ischemia. Bleeding will be normal, it will be edematous at first, and the size will decrease over the next two to three weeks. You never know exactly how much it's going to decrease, but you can assure your patients that it's typically very edematous afterwards and it will begin to decrease. You're watching very closely the, um, the color volume and consistency of the output. So if it's an ileostomy, you're gonna have much more output initially, but that will normalize over the next weeks. The patient will need to have some instruction on, on the right type of uh, pouching system. So again, that's gonna depend on what your hospital system has available and the type of ostomy and location. So um, they will need assistance learning how to do that. Typically the, um, the drainage pouch is, the dressing around it is changed every four to seven days or if it's leaking earlier. 
skin assessment will be um, very important. And we talked about um, you know noting the color and the output and typically want to empty that bag when it's um, a third full. We don't want to let it get in any f uh, fuller than that because it can the bag can burst and then again the heavier the bag is the more likely it's going to be pulling and then we have that pouching system leaking. So uh, we said, you know, skin breakdown is very important. So we can see the skin around the ostomy. If that ostomy appliance is not put on correctly, very close around the stoma, you can have skin breakdown around. And that can then increase their risk for infection. So we wanna make sure they know how to care for their skin. They're alerting their provider right away for any signs and symptoms of skin breakdown. Also, you know, they would be assessing their um, their stoma site every day and any type of infection. So here we can see we have um, this yellow drainage and buildup here, which would be signs and symptoms of infection. So anything like that, they would want to, again, let their provider know right away. Other things that we're worried about is electrolyte imbalances, and this is typically going to be more likely, again, with those patients who are having ileostomy but we're worried about uh, potassium, sodium, and any fluid volume deficits. So these patients may need additional teaching on appropriate diet, how much fluid to uh, take in, and then those would be things you'd be thinking about in your assessments of this patient. Are they having any signs and symptoms of hypokalemia or hyponatremia, and any signs and symptoms of dehydration? There are additional information um, on your course website about um, ostomy irrigation, living with an ostomy, and ostomies in general. So please make sure you review those. Thank you.